All right, so we're going to begin. Hello, and welcome to everyone out there listening on the internet. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on Mycotoxin Outlook 2018, The Rise of Humanizens, which is hosted by Biomint and Romer Labs. Both companies are part of EBA Group, and we're broadcasting live today from World Headquarters in Austria. My name is Ryan Hines. I'm the editor of Science and Solutions. Joining me here in the studio are Enos Taschen, Product Manager for Mycotoxin Risk Management at Biomin. Good morning. Hi there. And in a last minute change up in terms of speakers, we have Christian Alea, Head of Marketing and Product Management at Romer Labs. Hi, Christian. Good morning, Ren. Thank you for stepping in at the last moment due to an illness from another Romer Labs expert. We hope her a swift and prompt recovery. Uh, today's theme, we're going to touch on mycotoxin occurrence, detection, and mitigation. And I'd like to remind everyone in the audience listening that this is an interactive webinar. So when you open the toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll find a chat function for issues regarding audiovisual technical issues about the webinar platform itself. You can use this questions function at any time throughout the session, beginning now, to enter questions for our speakers and for the Q&A session, which will cap off today's session. In addition, you're going to be able to vote at several times throughout today's discussion. When I announce a poll question, you'll be able to provide your input in real time, and I'll announce those poll results. Let's begin with the first poll question. Have you encountered a problem with mycotoxins in the past 12 months? Yes? No? Or maybe. Now, Enos, while our audience members are choosing their answer, would you remind us about the relevance of mycotoxins when it comes to feed and farm animals? Well, um, there is a quite broad spectrum of effects caused by mycotoxins. But what is really important to know is that all mycotoxins, even at low concentrations, are causing immune suppression. And on top of this, um, they can also cause neurotoxicity or hepatotoxicity and carcinogenicity. And of course, they can also impair the reproduction system and they can also cause digestive disorders. And all of these effects will ultimately lead to a decrease in animal performances. And this will directly reflect it in the economic losses for the livestock industry. And we know that this costs the livestock industry billions of dollars each year. Well, wow. so certainly a serious topic. Uh, voting is now closed. Thank you for everyone who participated. Let's have a look at those results. I'm gonna read this off to you now. It looks like of everyone listening, we have 56% who chose yes. They've encountered a mycotoxin issue in the past 12 months, 23% no. And there's a good portion, one out of five participants said maybe this is an issue with their operation. Uh, Enos, what do you make of those results? Yeah, these results, they are not really a surprise because at Biomin we have been helping clients to cope with mycotoxin challenges now for over 25 years. And our research and also the annual survey program shows that mycotoxins are indeed a common issue in the animal feed. Great. And you've brought a preview of this year's Biomin mycotoxin survey results with you. Let's have a look at some of those numbers. Uh, this is a program that's been running since 2004. And last, this current issue, the report that's coming out, uh, has in its data set 18,757 finished feed and raw commodity samples that have been tested. Those have been sourced from 72 different countries and over 73,000 analyses were conducted. Okay, so this is a pretty big effort, I guess. Uh, what can you tell us? about the results here. What do does this data set show? Okay, let's uh, have a look on the worldwide contamination. Uh, first of all, I want to explain how to read this map. Um, in this world map, the sub-regions of the world are colored according to the percentage of samples above the risk thresholds. Oh, okay, so risk threshold, what exactly does that mean? Um, the risk thresholds, they are defined by Biomin due to worldwide practical experiences in the field and also due to scientific trials and, of course, according also to the literature. So what you can see here, yellow means that is a moderate risk 
up to red. Um, and this is representing an extreme risk with more than 75% of the tested samples very above the risk threshold. And when we take a look at the average contamination levels of the worldwide results in 2017 here, we can see that 62% of feed materials had at least one of the major mycotoxins present at the level that we know that could affect the animal's health or performance. And what we can see is that really all regions all around the world are affected by mycotoxins. And for the full detail in this world map, um, all of your participants will receive a link to the Biomin World Mycotoxin Survey report then in the next uh, 24 hours. That's great. I know that's a valuable tool that many look forward to receiving each year. Uh, today's session is billed as the rise of fumonazins. So according to your analysis, what's going on there? Well, uh, you can see the trend in the occurrence of fumonazins on this slide here. And what you can see is the global prevalence of fumonazins in corn in the last decade split up into half-year intervals. And it is best to look at the corn since this is the main crop affected by the fumonazins. And corn is, of course, the major feed source in most parts of the world and one of the main crops sampled also in our survey. And what you see is that there are strong fluctuations over the time and they are mainly caused by the influence of the weather and the climate during the growing, flowering and also the harvesting period. And in the last years, there could be observed a rise of fumonazins. So please note how fumonazins levels have risen since 2015 and the highest mean value um, was observed in the last 10 years now in 2017. Yeah, we certainly see a, a clear uptick in the chart over the past couple of years. Uh, it's very telling. Now, these are the global numbers. Uh, is this something that's happening everywhere equally worldwide or does it vary? And what's behind this trend? Yeah, well, this trend can be observed on nearly every continent, continent, except in certain regions of Europe, the risk was remaining quite stable. But in some parts of Southern Europe, even we could um, detect uh, a quite high levels of fumonazines in corn. And this is because higher temperatures around the harvest, um, they are favoring the progression of the main fumonazine producing fungi. And coming to the factors influencing the fumonazines occurrence, there are many facts um, that influencing the occurrence of the fumonazines and also other mycotoxins in general because we know, for example, that the climate change will decrease yields and also increase the mycotoxin contamination, as this environmental stress has been shown to have significant consequences for secondary metabolite production, and especially the mycotoxins. And furthermore, there are several other facts, for example, extreme drought episodes or desertifications, also floods or fluctuations between the wet and dry cycles, they really have an impact on the life cycles of the mycotoxin producing fungi. And weather conditions at a certain growing stage, for example, flowering and harvesting, they definitely influence the mycotoxin occurrence. And uh, to illustrate the impact of the weather during the harvesting period on the mycotoxin formation, I brought you one example. Okay. So, um, what you can see here is some pictures of the harvest condition in parts of Argentina in 2017. And there were heavy rainfalls and, and a flood. And what you can see is that the corn was really totally underwater. And by having a look on the Argentinian corn data after this harvesting time, we could observe a high risk in formonisin contamination as more than two thirds of the samples tested, they were above the risk threshold and they showed an average around 3,500 ppb. So this is really a lot. And with this, we can really see the impact uh, of the climate and the weather conditions on the level of the mycotoxins. Right, certainly some striking images. Now, what should we make of this trend? Should we be worried? What are the effects of fumonazins in farm animals? Yeah, of course, we should think about it because fumonazines, they are quite unique among the mycotoxins for their mode of action. We know that uh, the molecules of fumonazines, they have a high similar structure to the sphingoid base. 
And that's why they interfere with the action of an enzyme, which is necessary for the sphingolipid production. And we know that sphingolipids, they play a key role in the cell functions all around the body. And in addition to this, um, fumonisins are carcinogenic and they are suppressing the immune system. And they are particularly toxic to pigs as they can cause pulmonary edema and also pancreatic necrosis, for example. Poultry um, is less susceptible to formalisins, but in high concentrations, liver necrosis and disorders of the nervous system can be observed as well. Wow. Okay, so again, a serious issue. Uh, in addition to the rise of formalisins, did you decipher any other trends out of the most recent year's data? Yeah, of course, um, by having a look here on this slide. Um, in South American countries, for example, we can see an increase in the occurrence of Don and Fumonisins, also in soya bean. And soya bean, which was once considered as a low mycotoxin risk crop, has become a crop to monitor more closely now. This is more than a local issue, as soya beans produced in South America are exported and included in animal diets throughout the world. So the whole world is affected by high uh, levels in South American countries. And by having a look on, on Europe, there was a sharp increase in the prevalence of T2 toxin in cereals and the level of Don and Fum in corn detected. And especially Northern Europe showed an increase in the T2 toxin. Okay, now researchers have identified hundreds of different mycotoxins and metabolites. Um, in the latest analysis, how many mycotoxins would you find in an average sample? You can see this on our Spectrum 380 results from 2017. This is the state-of-the-art method offered by Biomin that can measure over 380 mycotoxins and, and secondary metabolites. So in this year, there were 905 samples analyzed in total. And by having a look at these results, we can see that the co-contamination uh, is really very common. So just to explain you what you can see uh, on the left picture, uh, the x-axis, um, you can see the metabolites per sample, and on the y-axis, we can see the proportion of the samples in percent. And most of the samples, as you can see on this graph, they are containing between 20 and 29 metabolites. Furthermore, we found out that on average, we had 32 metabolites per sample, so this is really a lot. And we also observed that 9.7 out of 10 samples were contaminated with fusarium toxins, so nearly every sample or every sample. And we can also see that 97% of tested samples were contaminated with more than 10 different toxins and metabolites. So this is also really a lot. Sure, definitely some eye-opening numbers there. Um, are, when we look at mycotoxin patterns, is it similar everywhere, or is there a regional variation? Does it depend on one from one geography to another? Do we see differences? Could you walk us through that? Mm -hmm. uh, let me go through that on a region-by-region region basis. Um, we have for each region a map that shows the sub-regional risk. So starting with Asia, in general, Asia um, has seen an increase this year in the overall proportion of the risk samples. And the rise has been seen mainly in East Asia, where we had with 68% already a really high risk level last year. But this year, there was again an increase, and we could see a risk level of 92%. In South Asia, we were reaching a level of 74% this year. And in Australia, we have more moderate levels, but also an increased risk from 16% last year year to 24% risk now in 2017. And South Asia, which was at a very high risk level last year, showed a bit of decrease, but still reaching a risk level um, of 70%. Okay, now I think some of the questions that we've already received when uh, many of our attendees registered for today was, you know, what does this mean for my animals? Could you walk us through that? 
of course, um, this is exactly what I want to show you next. Um, first of all, I want to explain the graphs, how to read them. So the gray bars indicate the proportions of samples with each mycotoxin detected. And the pictures of the animals are colored according to the proportion of samples above the risk threshold for each animal type. So by having a look, uh, look on Asia, Dawn is one of the main concerns in all species. So in Asia, there could be observed a high risk for pigs, poultry, and ruminants as well. And the formonacin levels are more of a concern for pigs, as you can see on the graph. And for seralenone, we really have to consider the effects on pigs and poultry. Um, the aflatoxins occurred in 38% of the samples in Asia, but the levels were not that alarming for the single species. Great. And this is information that's found in the annual report as well, is that right? Of course, yeah. Okay. You can all find this information in the report. Now, moving on, what can you tell us about other parts of the world? Yeah, we'll move on with Europe. In Europe, there was a slight decrease of dawn contamination observed in Central Europe, but still more than two thirds of all samples were tested positive for dawn in this region. And this decrease was only detected in this region because in Southern, Eastern and Northern Europe, the dawn levels were increasing as well as the levels of fumonicins. In Southern Europe, um, 84% of all tested samples were positive for FUM. And moreover, also the occurrence of T2 toxin was increasing this year in the European countries. As I mentioned it already at the highlight slide. So for example, in Northern Europe, the T2 toxin occurred in already 48% of the tested samples. And overall, there was a risk level detected of 57% in Northern Europe. Um, 67% in Central Europe, and 37% in Southern, and 65% in Eastern Europe. And also have a closer look on the animals. So the same as in, in 2016, also in 2017, Dawn was the standoff mycotoxin of concern. So the Dawn levels, they are frequently at the level of concern for pig and poultry. And all the other toxins were occurring quite often. However, the risk level were quite uh, moderate. Okay. Can you tell us a bit about the situation in the Middle East when it comes to mycotoxins? Yes. Uh, in the Middle East, the total risk level was increasing up to 61%. Especially the contamination with formonicins, Don and Ochotoxin was rising in this region. And by having a closer look, we can see a foam contamination of 70 4% detected in samples from Middle East. And overall, the risk remains high, and this poses a high risk to the animals. And also in this region, we can see levels of high concern for dawn for all animal species. And furthermore, we observed an interestingly high prevalence of seralenone here, especially for pig and poultry. The levels are really risky. So please consider this mycotoxin in particularly in breeding operations. Certainly something to keep in mind. Um, can you tell us about Africa? Yes, in Africa, the total risk level was increasing up to 74%, especially the contamination with formonicins, Don and Ochatoxin was rising in this region. And overall, the risk remains quite high and this poses really a high risk to the animals. Only for seralenone and aflatoxin, there was a slight <laughs> decrease detected in the samples from, from Africa. By having a look on the species, it's Don and Fum occurring the most here, but please also watch out the Afla levels in some areas, because these results, they are also including South Africa and most of the results we got from South African region. And this region is generally a bit lower contaminated with, with aflatoxin, so this does not mean that in the rest of Africa there is no, no aflatoxin problem occurring. Okay. Now, it's still quite early morning uh, in the Western Hemisphere, but as you mentioned, uh, because of global trade patterns, it's still important to look at commodity situations uh, in places like South America and North America. Can you tell us about mm -hmm. that? I will. 
prepared an overview about the Americas, starting with the North America. By having a look on this slide, um, you can see we observed a risk um, of 80%. So this was rising from 66% in 2016 to 80% now in 2007 in North America. This is really, really high. And Don and Seralenon were the highest annual threats in this region. And we know that these two toxins can work together to make things even worse for the animal. But please also have a look on the pomonisins. They are representing also a high threat in this region, especially um, for the pigs. As you can see here on the graphs, colored in dark orange. And coming to Central and South America, in Central and South America, the risk remains high at the level of 80% in Central America and 74% in South America. And there we, in South America, we had an increase from last year 60% to now 74%. And Central and South America are showing also high risk for all animal species. And again, Dawn and Fum were occurring that high that they are really representing a high threat in this region. Great. Thank you, Ines, for that preview of the 2017 Biomin Mycotoxin <laughs> Survey results. We're going to move on now uh, to the topic of mycotoxin detection. And we're going to open up the discussion with poll question number two. How do you test for mycotoxins? Please go ahead and choose the answer that best suits your situation. Now, Christian, Romer Labs has been rapidly expanding and in testing into other analytes, such as pathogens and GMOs. But you began as a mycotoxin testing company, isn't that right? Indeed, Ryan, that's correct. Mycotoxins have been at the heart of Romer Labs since our beginnings in 1982. So we started with mycotoxins. Now, with more than 35 years of experience in this field, we feature one of the broadest portfolios of mycotoxin testing solutions on the market, ranging from on-site screening methods to products and solutions for reference testing methods applied in the lab. Great. And we're going to talk about some of those in a minute. Um, but right now, we're going to look at the poll results. The poll is now closed. Thank you for everyone who's participated. I'm going to have a look right here at those numbers. <coughs> and we have 28% of our audience who selected on-site testing as their method of choice, a full 60%, the majority, who use an external analytical service, 7% do not currently test for mycotoxins, and 5% are not sure at this point. Chris, what do you make of those results? Do they align with what you see in the market? Well. Ryan, these results don't surprise us at all. Yeah? Summing up, we have close to 90% of our viewers testing for mycotoxins. This is pretty much in line with what we are hearing from the market. People realize that you can't really manage what you don't measure. You can't manage the mycotoxin risk without measuring the prevalence of mycotoxins in raw materials and in feed. So a proper mycotoxin assessment is therefore key in defining the right mycotoxin management strategy. And to be honest, with current available methods, it has actually never been easier to test for mycotoxins than it is today. Okay, so regarding the available methods, um, <laughs> what methods to test for mycotoxins exist? What's out there? And because it sounds like there's more than one, how do you choose the one that's best suited to you? Yeah, so when it comes to testing for mycotoxins, I think the first thing we need to uh, decide is whether we run the test ourselves on site or we send samples in to an analytical service lab. This decision depends on three main considerations, and these are the required testing throughput, the acceptable time to result, and required quality of results. Uh, for high volume or frequent testing, for instance, it might be worth conducting tests on site since costs are generally low. If you only perform occasional testing or have low throughput, sending samples to an analytical service lab could be more convenient for you. When it comes to the time to result, on-site rapid tests will deliver results within an hour, with letter flow devices even as fast as 10 minutes. This makes rapid tests the tool of choice when decision time is short, like for instance when deciding whether to accept a grain truck delivery at raw material reception points. On the other side, from start to finish, analytical service results can take anywhere from two days to a week, so that's quite a big difference there. 
Now, uh, when it comes to the required result quality, some on-site tests can be recognized or categorized as screening tools in that they provide a quick indication of the presence of just one analyte per test. Reference methods available at the medical service laboratory, on the other hand, are certainly more robust. This offer greater reliability on a larger number of analytes, also due to the accredited process that sometimes stands behind. Okay, so tell us more about the on-site methods. Sure, so what we mainly see are two methods out there. When it comes to testing on-site, the most popular methods are strip tests and DELISA tests. These are both antibody-based methods, but differ in some key areas. Strip tests are designed to give results as soon as possible, though they can only process two samples at a time. They are therefore widely used at reception points in the supply chain of agricultural raw commodities. ELISA, so enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays, can test up to 44 samples at the same time. In general, therefore, ELISA is the better option when you have six or more samples. The price difference is here quickly compensated due to the need to buy fewer kits and the obvious time you save. Great. So from what I'm hearing, if I have a low number of samples or I need accredited results, then we're going to be talking more about external lab service in that case. Is that right? That is correct. And then that's also a very good point because even when we are sending samples to the medical service lab, one has to decide which technology should be used. So in addition to classic ELISA, reference methods like HPLC, so high performance liquid chromatography, and LCMSMS, liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry, can be chosen. Key differences are related here to price, the number of analytes per run, and test accuracy. Reference methods analyze your sample for multiple toxins in one go. And this is an advantage. For example, the LCMSMS multi-mycotoxin method, currently developed by Romalabs, is capable of analyzing more than 50 toxins at a time. And this is a commercial available method. Great. Now, many of our viewers are interested in getting fast results on site, but there's always a question of getting started. How easy is it for a new user to test for mycotoxins on site? That's a great question. We really get it quite, quite often. Uh, the setup is really simple and fast. Basically, all you need is a room with a standard power supply. Everything else can be provided by Romalabs, for instance. The handling is really simple, as you only need few procedural steps to conduct the testing. You can learn it within, I would even say, half an hour. When completing the test, you get straightforward results, which can easily be documented. And that's certainly a great advantage. Um, what we have is the fact that on-site testing consists of three simple steps. You have sample preparation, you have the analysis, and you have result documentation. First, mycotoxins are extracted from grain kernels into a liquid to make them accessible for the analysis. In the past, this was done with statuses, organic solvents like methanol. Nowadays, uh, our Watex technology allows for mycotoxin extraction using only water in combination with an environmental-friendly buffer bag. This makes the purchase, the handling, and the disposal of organic solvents obsolete. This technology also enables the analysis of aflatoxins, deoxinibalenol, seralenone, and formonisins from the same sample extract, tremendously reducing testing time in this case. Well, that's great. Reduced testing time and more environmentally friendly. Sounds like a winning combination. Christian, can you walk us through the test procedure? Sure. So. Uh, Here's, here's how it works. Uh, you simply add your sample, a buffer bag and bottled water in a filter bag. You shake it and then let it settle. Filter and buffer bags are provided with a kit, so there is no need to purchase anything extra because the wool pack bags used provide an integrated filter. No additional filtration or centrifugation steps are required. Uh, the second step, the analysis of the sample, takes place on a dipstick that is similar to a pregnancy test. Uh, the strip test is put into the deleted sample extract and then put in an incubator for three minutes. Then the analysis is completed and a reader quantifies the result within seconds. This shows a measurement, in this case a concentration value such as parts per billion, so that you can assess the quality of your raw material. The last step is to document your results. This can be done either by a printout or by a transfer to a computer, as you can see in the displayed summary. This provides you with objective results, and the important is that you also can file those for later use. Excellent. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Thank you, Christian.
for those insights on mycotoxin detection. Now, once you have the results in hand, and have identified a mycotoxin contamination in your operation, you're probably gonna to want to mitigate the risk to your animals. We're gonna talk about mitigation strategies now, uh, and we're going to open that discussion with a third and final poll question. In the past 12 months, which mycotoxin mitigation methods have you used? Please choose the best answer, either mycotoxin binder, multi-strategy mycotoxin deactivator, good quality control and feed management, mycotoxins are not an issue, or currently looking for a solution. And as our internet audience is answering that question, Ines, would you tell us the difference between those first two options? Yes, of course. So what is a binder? A binder is typically a bentonite or a clay that is able to bind aflatoxins. <clears throat> but with a binder, you cannot bind, for example, dioxinevalanone or serralinone. This is really not possible. And <clears throat> the multi-strategy is a more innovative solution. And this is containing different strategies to counteract the different mycotoxins, not only aflatoxins. Great. Thank you for that explanation. We're going to close the voting now, and I'm going to read out the results. And it looks like we have a pretty even distribution across the top three choices. 33% of you chose mycotoxin binder as a mitigation method of choice. 29% selected a multi-strategy mycotoxin deactivator. 33% selected good quality control and feed management. 5% said this is not an issue right now. And we have 18% currently looking for a solution. So a very mixed picture. What do you, are those results surprising to you at all? No, not really. Um, but let me go um, to the binder because most of you were chosen the, that they are using a binder. And I have to say, even if you select a proven and reliable binder, you've still only solved a part of the problem, as I mentioned already um, um, before. So the most common mycotoxins in our annual survey, for example, is DON, and DON is, of course, not able to be bound. And we need to add a couple of more strategies to the mycotoxin risk management to address these less bound mycotoxins. And, of course, um, we know that every farm is different, and with your detection results in hand, um, a biomine representative can help you, of course, um, to find the right solution that fits best for your needs. Okay, now what goes into the multi-strategy approach? So, I prepared a slide on our product Microfix, the fifth generation. And as we know, mycotoxins, they have different structures and that's why the different strategies are needed for their counteraction. And our product Microfix has st three strategies. We have the absorption, the biotransformation, and the bioprotection. Um, the absorption via the bentonite is proven by going through the full process of EU authorization for the binding of aflatoxins and endotoxins. And this means that the binding is also proven in real farm conditions. And then we have also the biotransformation component containing also the authorized fumzyme for the degradation of fumonisins, the authorized BBSH for the breakdown of trichothetines, and the MTV com component um, responsible for counteracting serralinone and ochatoxins. And on top of this, uh, Microfix contains all the bioprotection component to help and protect the liver and immune system from the effects of the mycotoxins. Now Ines, there are a lot of anti-mycotoxin products out there on the market. What sets Mycofix apart? Yeah, Biomine is the first and only company with an EU authorization for five ingredients to deactivate the mycotoxins. And since 2013 and 2014, we have the registration for the bentonite for all animal species and the BBSH and the purified enzyme FUMSIGN for the pigs. And now in 2017, we got also the registration of BBSH and FUMSIGN for all avian species. 
And part of achieving the EU authorization for the biotransformation aspects was proving that the approaches are effective at degrading the target mycotoxins and that they are degraded into compounds of low or even no toxicity. And Biomin leads this technology worldwide thanks to a true commitment to research and also development. Now, on the research and development front, tell me a bit about the science of Mycofix and how it works and how we know that it works. Yeah, to reach this registration, there are a lot of requirements uh, necessary. For example, we have to run several trials to prove the safety and also the efficacy of the products. And Biomin has a lot of cooperations um, with leading universities all around the world. And as you can see here, there were several peer-reviewed papers published in this field, as it is required to prove the efficacy of the product, not only in vitro, but also in vivo. And this we could reach. Okay. Now, we've had several participants ask about the correct inclusion rate of mycofix in diets in order to achieve a sufficient level <laughs> of protection. What, what is the proper inclusion rate? Yeah, the answer is not that easy because the inclusion rate depends on different factors. And first of all, we have to consider the contamination levels and as well as the mycotoxins which are occurring in your diet. And it also depends on the production stage and on the animal species. But anyway, as I mentioned, you can always contact the sales representative from Biomin and they will help you with your needs and help you to find the right solution for your farm. Great. Thank you, Ines. Just wanted to take a brief moment to point out that for those of you interested in staying up to date on the current, the latest survey results from the Biomin Mycotoxin Survey, you can download the Mycofix app for Apple and Android. That's available on biomin.net. You can find it on the Apple Store and the Google Store as well. Now, at this time, Ines Christian, we're going to open it up to some questions from the audience. For those of you listening, if you haven't done so already, feel free to go ahead and use that chat function to send us your questions. Now, <laughs> we've also received many, many questions when everyone registered, and given the number of participants today, we won't be able to get to all questions during the live session, but there will be an online follow-up that everyone will receive via email in the days that follow. Christian, let's start with you. Which raw materials are mostly affected by fumonescence? Well, Ryan, I think Inish already briefly touched upon this uh, when she started with her presentation. Uh, data shows at this point that fumonescence are usually found in corn and corn-based products. And from what I could see, the biomine mycotoxin survey results tend to confirm this. Absolutely. Now, Ines, here we have a question about what is the expected impact of various levels of mycotoxins on young poultry? Yeah, mycotoxins on poultry, the mycotoxins affect the poultry in a wide range of ways, varying from immune suppression to increased mortality in, in very severe cases. And generally speaking, you can always say the younger the animal, the higher the risk for the mycotoxicosis as the immune system is developing and the defense mechanisms are negatively influenced by the mycotoxins. And this can lead, of course, to reduce growth or interference with the reproduction system. And a generally higher susceptible susceptibility to the diseases is possible. Okay. So that's interesting. So younger animals are generally more susceptible to the effects of mycotoxins. Yes, that's right. And that's not just poultry, that's also other it's, species. Uh, not only for poultry, you in general, you can say the younger the animals, the more susceptible. They okay. Are. Great. Um, Christian, how can one effectively screen for aflatoxin M1 in milk? Okay, yeah, good question. Uh, well, aflatoxin is known to metabolize and then be carried over as aflatoxin M1 into milk. Uh, there are many countries that have extremely strict regulations for aflatoxin M1. The road testing is certainly key. But with regard to limits in a PPT range, testing methods well, have on. to be ask you, uh, very sensitive. Tell me about that. A PPT range, for those who don't know. Parts per trillion. Okay. It's really, really, really low amounts that, that the regulators are 
um, setting up as a regulatory limit. Okay. So uh, again, the testing methods have to be really very sensitive in order to be able to detect those levels. So reference methods like uh, HPLC and LCM SMS, but also ELISA tests are currently the methods of choice. But uh, there are some lateral flow devices also commercially available <laughs> with sensitivities meeting many of those regulatory limits, but certainly not all. As to the question uh, and how to choose the best method, I think the same principles apply that we discussed at the beginning. Great. <clears throat> so, Ines, we have a question here um, that speaks to the case where, you know, a Clinical mycotoxicity is, let's say, more obvious or more easily detected because there are clear symptoms and signs, uh, whereas the subclinical version uh, is perhaps more difficult to identify. So the question here is how can I detect subclinical mycotoxicity in my animals? That's a good question. Um, we know that mycotoxins have different effects on the different origins and on the animal's productivity and also on the health. And it is not easy to detect subclinical uh, toxicity, although it is obvious that there are already an effect on the toxins long time before the symptoms are visible. And the mycotoxins, they are affecting more than one system simultaneously. And therefore, they are producing many types of responses in the affected animals and this happens already a long time before you can really see it on the animal so would it be fair to say then that testing the feed and the feed ingredients is something that needs to be done regularly of course this is really necessary that you know about your levels in your feet excellent and christian i think you probably agree with that statement huh i certainly do yeah. <laughs> okay um we're coming close to the end of today's session uh, but i think we can have one more question each uh, Christian, back to you. Uh, here we've got a question specifically on the, the fumonazins and the rise of fumonazins. So what's the best method for determining fumonazins that's quick accurate, and accurate over a wide range of concentrations, all while being inexpensive? You know, the, the dream solution. Okay, yeah. Uh, so obviously if, if, if price is what you're worried about, then, then rapid testing solutions might be worth looking into. Both lateral flow and ELISAs are accurate and quick methods for detecting fomonisins. For example, the aggressive fomonisin Watek test kits has been approved by GIPSA, so, and that testifies only to its accuracy. And furthermore, its range of application has been recently extended to 100 ppm, which covers quite a broad contamination range. Okay, great. So our final question goes back to you, Ines. And relates to one of the comments you made earlier about certain combinations of mycotoxins that could be dangerous. I think you pointed out uh, Don and Foom. Uh, that relates to synergism. So what does that mean when we're talking about mycotoxins? Yeah, synergism is definitely something we have to consider because it's, it's standard to find more than one mycotoxin present in one feed sample. And if there is different mycotoxins present at one time, this is leading to so-called synergistic effects. And this means that uh, the effects caused by the single mycotoxins are impressed much more severe. So simply said, one plus one is not two. Um, one plus one is, uh, for example, 10. So if I give you an example, Don and Fum is present, then the effects of those toxins on the animals are much more severe than if they are would occur occurring alone. Okay, understood. So that's going to conclude today's questions and answers. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there will be follow-up via email and on our websites and going in the days that follow. Uh, Christian and Enos, I want to thank you both for joining us today. And Thanks. Pleasure joining you. I want to point out that as a follow-up and as promised, our internet audience will be receiving a number of items, including uh, the yet to be published, but coming out very shortly, uh, Biomin World Mycotoxin Survey 2017, the Romer Labs Sampling Guide, which is a useful tool to have handy, and a number of videos, including an on-site testing video from Romer Labs, and also one about MycoFix and how that works.
uh, to mitigate mycotoxins. Uh, those will be coming in the next 24 hours. Please look for those. Uh, and of course, if you ever have any other questions, feel free to contact a company representative from Biomin or from Romer Labs. Uh, with that, we are going to close today's session. I want to thank all of you who listened and participated uh, for your input in the polls, et cetera, and for your interest in Romer Labs and Biomin. Uh, once we close, you'll be prompted to answer a short survey on today's webinar. I please would encourage you to go ahead and take the two minutes necessary to answer those questions. By providing your feedback, you allow us to improve our webinar program and identify future topics for discussion, and it's much appreciated. So thank you for, in advance for that. Thank you for joining today's webinar, and have a great day.